Good morning and thank you for joining us today. This is episode 11 of series 3 of 39 from 39, which is a series of webinars given by the property environment and planning team at 39 Essex Chambers. My colleague David and I are going to talk in theory for around 39 minutes on certain property disputes which arise between neighbours. We have found that since homeowners and occupiers have been largely confined to their properties with varying levels of strictness over the past 15 months, neighbours disputes have been on the rise. Whether it's getting hacked off at overhanging branches or seeking to extend property or maximise space or renewing boundary features, there have been greater opportunities for disputes to bubble up. The three broad areas that we're going to talk about are on the screen now. They are the maintenance and improvement of property, noise and disturbance, and encroachment by a lessee on land that is not demised to them under a lease. And we're going to try to focus on neighbour disputes from these, or, or these issues with uh, the neighbour dispute angle. We will leave some time at the end for questions, uh, and we can also pick up questions as we go through. So please do leave your questions using the question and answer feature on Zoom. Before then we start, I just wanted to talk briefly about neighbour disputes and how they're received by the courts. We know that neighbour disputes are often very messy. Parties can become entrenched very quickly. Ordinary or minor issues can become the source of daily tension and altercations. I often find that the comments of Lord Justice Mummery in Wilkinson and Farmer are instructive, and I try to keep those in mind when I'm advising clients. That case, Wilkinson Farmer, was about the width of a right of way and it was actually appealed twice. Lord Justice Mummery said this, the whole exercise has been an uncomfortable experience of unsatisfactory aspects of the conduct and cost of neighbour disputes in the courts. Everybody agrees that, if at all possible, disagreements between neighbours about rights of way, boundaries or whatever should be settled without ever going near a court. In my view, professional advisors have a duty to warn their clients at an early stage about the downside of neighbour litigation, even for a successful party. If the case goes to court, there is, as this case shows, some uncertainty about the ultimate outcome. The case does not always end with a trial. Appeals are possible. What is certain is that at the end of the day, one of the parties will lose and will usually finish up fixed with an order to pay very considerable legal costs. That is not good for the losing party, or for the prospect of harmonious relations between neighbours who continue to live next door to each other after the case is over. It's a lengthy quote, I'll just continue the next paragraph. He then said, the cost and stress of a court case will often result in the further deterioration of already damaged relationships. The parties might be horrified to discover that the litigation has blighted their properties as well as their lives. These cases, which have increased with the rise in home ownership, present priority problems for an overstretched civil justice system. When a neighbour dispute gets to court, there is a risk of it looking relatively unimportant to everyone except the parties. Sometimes neighbour disputes are trivial, even then they are potentially ruinous in financial and human terms for both sides. As I mentioned, I find it's always a good idea to keep this case, or at least the sentiments expressed within it, firmly in mind, uh, because neighbour disputes really do get out of control very quickly. What other steps can we take then as, as advisors? Well, ADR is always... Uh, is always an option and it's an option that we must consider under various professional conduct rules and also bearing in mind the guidance in this case. What I think is unhelpful is that there's little statutory guidance on ADR. We obviously don't have any mandatory mediation or um, other ADR that parties must comply with. There is the Property Boundaries Dis Resolution of Disputes Bill which has been trundling through Parliament for the best part of a decade. Uh, you may have heard about it it sets out a procedure very similar to the procedure in the Party Wall Act for the appointment of a surveyor to determine boundary or right-of-way disputes before getting anywhere close to the courts and for the courts to apply cost sanctions if parties don't follow that procedure. That's, as I mentioned, not yet law. It's currently through its second reading in the House of Lords and I'm not holding my breath that it will receive royal assent anytime soon. So in the meantime, it falls upon us to consider how best to advise clients to avoid escalating tensions and costs if at all possible. I'm going to start by looking at the maintenance and improvement of property and you may have seen this photo recently. It's partly the inspiration for this, this webinar. Um, this photo is taken from the BBC News website that it uh, shows property in Sheffield 
uh, which made the headlines a couple of weeks back, occupiers of one property, you can guess which, um, who had been neighbours for more than 20 years, decided to cut overhanging branches from this conifer, claiming that birds were nesting in the tree and causing a nuisance on their driveway. According to the parties involved, unsurprisingly, perhaps this dispute began to heat up last March 2020 when government restrictions were first introduced. The result is a rather sorry looking conifer or half a conifer. In, in principle, where there are overhanging branches from a tree, a neighbour is permitted to cut back those branches. The same would apply to any roots that extend over the boundary. I would be a little bit concerned though, in, in this case in particular, but other cases similar to it, where in taking such action and getting a tree surgeon to cut back branches, it damages or kills off the tree. If that tree falls, uh, it's very likely that the neighbour whose tree it is, on the left hand side there, would be able to bring a claim in trespass and seek damages for the cost of replacing the tree. Uh, it goes without saying that the parties in that case could have discussed uh, the damage and the inconvenience being caused uh, it would have resulted in less, uh, perhaps a, a, a more um, visually acceptable outcome than half a tree on the driveway. Uh, it does appear that there was some dialogue, but as often happens, unfortunately, neighbours take matters into their own hands and decide that unilateral action is their best bet. But the the short, the long short of this is that the neighbour was entitled to do this. It's just it, it obviously isn't a, an ideal outcome for anybody. Um, it, it seems then in that case that tree surgeons could chop the branches without accessing the neighbouring owner, the tree owner's land. What options are there, though, where you need access to your neighbour's land? Uh, there is the Access to Neighbouring Land Act 1992. Um, it, it is uh, clearly it's, it's an act that's been around for a while, but there are no authorities um, on, on this act. There are no authorities whatsoever. So it, it's, it's difficult to know exactly how some of the act might be interpreted um, if it if you brought an, a, an action for an access order under it but you can seek an access order under the uh, under this act an owner can apply for an access order where a, a neighbor is refusing access to their own land there's a two-stage test the works that uh, the owner is intending to carry out must be reasonably necessary for the preservation of the whole or any other part of the building and his land and the works cannot be carried out or would be substantially more difficult to carry out if access to your neighbour's land isn't granted. The order isn't automatic. The court won't make an access order where it's satisfied that the respondent, so your neighbour or any other person, would suffer an unreasonable amount of interference or disturbance of the use of enjoyment of their land or they would suffer unreasonable hardship. And it's not possible to seek a payment of a, a reasonable sum for the privilege of access where it's residential land. You can only seek payment from the court of the, for, for privilege to access um, your, your neighbour's privilege to access your land um, if it's non-residential. Um, as I say, no reported decisions, so it, it's difficult to see or it's difficult to know in advance how likely it is an order might be granted where it's opposed on good grounds. Um, what other options does an owner or occupier have? Well, if it's leasehold land, check the lease and well-drafted leases and even in poorly drafted leases, in fact, tenants will often have access rights to other land that isn't theirs um, in an emergency, but also where they want to carry out works to their own property. If hedges are involved as well, it's possible to complain to the council. So um, this wouldn't have applied in the case of the neighbours from Sheffield because there was a single tree, but where there is a hedge of evergreen trees or shrubs um, that are getting out of control and more than two metres high, it's possible to complain under the Antisocial Behaviour Act 2003. Again, it's getting legal and you would want to encourage your client, property owner, to speak and enter into dialogue with the neighbour first, but it is possible to seek a remedial notice from the council. The council would issue a remedial notice where trees are getting out of hand or hedges are getting out of hand. When does the Act not apply? Well, despite the Law Commission recommendations, the Access to Neighbouring Land Act 1992 doesn't apply to improvements or where the predominant purpose of the works appears to be improvement to your own land. That's important, I think, because it highlights the need to approach these situations very carefully. Where your client wants to carry out improvements to their property, knowing that their neighbour has no obligation to grant access rights, certainly not under this Act, means that um, it, it really is important to, to keep um, neighbours on the right side of each other and um, to 
explore dialogue rather than um, self-help or action that um, is going to lead to court proceedings. I'll now pass over to David on other ways in which access may be obtained. If we go back to that tree, uh, I had a quick look at the case law and the House of Lords Authority that determines that you are allowed to cut overhanging branches is lemon and web from 1895. But in fact, if you go back into the yearbooks, you see substantial discussion about the rights uh, where trees overhang another property. And you have to, in the eyes of the law, offer up the branches you uh, cut or lot off the tree and offer them back to your neighbour, uh, because otherwise it would be conversion of your neighbour's branches. Now, I've never done that myself, um, but it might be something uh, could be seen if it's a valuable tree, such as a fruit tree, it's, it's, it could be seen as a valuable right. So you can see the kind of law we're dealing with is very much encrusted into uh, the common law. So moving beyond trees uh, sometimes you have a benefit of an easement for access and it's impossible to uh, characterize these in general terms but recently been looking at an easement and the case of rice gold limited against escola limited from 2008 uh, came up where the dominant owner had the right to enter upon such parts of the yard at the rear as is necessary for purpose of carrying out any maintenance repair, rebuilding, or renewal. And the owner of a dominant tenant actually erected fencing, scaffolding, and a tower crane for 45 weeks. And that was held uh, to fall within the right that was granted. So easements that allow you to enter onto the land for maintenance or repair uh, can give you uh, quite a lot uh, in terms of access. And of course, last year, was the Court of Appeal case in Earl of Plymouth against Reese, uh, 2020 uh, EWCA uh, CIV 816, where a right of entry uh, reserved under a lease uh, allowed the landlord to leave monitoring equipment uh, on the tenant's uh, land on site for a few days. So easements uh, for maintenance and improvement might well uh, be of value. As for the uh, Party Wall Act, uh, that can uh, lead to quite considerable rights. Uh, if you can establish there is a party wall, uh, you can serve a notice under Section 1 intending to build a party wall. Uh, the section also deals with footings. So if it isn't going to be a party wall, we plan to uh, install footings, uh, where Section 2, subsection 2, gives rights of repair for party structures. Now, before the webinar, we had a question uh, come uh, into chambers uh, about uh, what happens if you don't know whether or not it's a party wall act structure. And I think, mean, Niraj, uh, we debated this answer and came to a similar result, didn't we? Yes, David. The, the question in this case was, uh, you have adjacent properties with water ingress through the roof and works are required to the roof valley. And it's unclear whether, as you mentioned, that roof valley is a party wall structure or not. Um, so in order to ascertain the scope of works and to try and get access to inspect, to, to work out whether it's a party wall structure, it seemed to us actually, or it seemed to me that um, one could apply for an access order under section 17 of the Access to Neighbouring Land Act 1992. Uh, section 17 provides that if an inspection is reasonably necessary for the purpose of ascertaining, for example, the scope of works or otherwise in connection with works to the dominant land, that's your own land, then access um, can be permitted by court order. Um, it, it's, I don't think it's necessarily the only answer or it might not necessarily be the right answer because clearly if there's a controversy over who the roof valley or that part of the roof valley belongs to, there might be an argument that that's not the dominant land, it's not your land and you therefore can't access your neighbour's land to inspect it. But I think that raises a point about the party wall acts in general, uh, that often those go hand in glove with boundary disputes as well. So that's something to, to bear in mind. I've often seen uh, party wall act disputes actually um, be more akin to boundary disputes. A few more uh, points. Uh, crane over sale. Uh, leading case of us is Anchor Brew House against Barclay House, 
uh, reaffirmed the ad calum rule so that if you have a laughing jib crane uh, that's left in free swing mode uh, and if it starts to oversell neighboring land uh, then that is uh, still a trespass and you might well be uh, subject to uh, an injunction on in the facts of that case of course uh, the owner of the land where the crane was situated had entered into an agreement with one landowner and not another. So it could well be seen as being uh, quite a deliberate and intentional rather than inadvertent uh, breach of the neighbouring landowner's property rights. Um, it's easiest, as we've indicated, to get a licence or permission uh, with the neighbouring landowner. And that in itself uh, can lead to issues if there's a premium to be paid uh, as to valuation. I have to say, I'm looking at the Q&As, and the case of Lemon and Webb has provoked uh, some considerable controversy, um, particularly as to how such hoary old law interacts with the question of tree preservation orders. And one of the questions I have is, what are the options for a landowner where a TPO protected tree is on unregistered land but overhangs uh, your land? Well, first of all, uh, the case law wasn't determined when we had tree preservation orders, and it's, you have to uh, comply with any tree preservation order uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to the lands. What I've said is strictly in relation to uh, private law rights. In terms of those private law rights, it wouldn't matter uh, whether or not uh, you know the identity of the neighbouring owner. The ratio of the and Webb was you don't need to give notice as a matter of private law. Uh, to the neighbouring owner, but you must also be uh, aware, of course, of the public law issue of to the TPO. Uh, I've also got a question, can you demand the neighbour who owns the tree to lop his branches back to a legal boundary or pay for my costs in doing this work? There's no direct authority on this point. Uh, however, in Canary Wharf and Hunter, uh, there was a, a discussion uh, as to damages uh, for nuisance and the question of abatement, because of course the remedy you're being applying here isn't just self-help or help yourself, it's abatement. And it was suggested that you can claim the reasonable costs of abating the nuisance. And of course, if this is a trespass, then you might well be able to claim the reasonable costs of abating the trespass. But given that the uh, value uh, of these uh, lot branches are normally unlikely to trouble the uh, high court bench. Uh, they were unlikely to see much case law, but I would certainly suggest that if there is a serious trespass by, by tree branches, there might well be a, a remedy uh, via Hunter and Canary Wharf that would deal with that. Now, Going on to noise, disturbance, and other tenants. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the case of Duval against 11 to 13 uh, Randolph uh, Crescent Limited. And this case is an important one. It's an important one for management of leasehold uh, properties. Uh, this was a converted uh, terrace property in Maida Vale, uh, two mid terrace houses, uh, now a single block. Uh, separated into nine flats, all along leases, two leases held by Dr. Duval, a third lease by Mrs. Winfield, and the landlord is also the management company. So you can visualise quite a typical structure, but of course the same law could apply if there are 100 flats inside a, a building, a multi-occupancy block. Two terms, and we, are, we regularly see these, particularly in residential properties, but also in commercial properties, uh, 2.6, not to make any alteration to the demise premises without the uh, consent uh, of the landlord. So subject to question of uh, reasonableness uh, by the landlord. Uh, 2.7, not to commit waste or cut may or injure roof, wall or ceiling within or enclosing the demise premises. So the classic uh, absolute prohibition uh, on, on the tenant to uh, cut parts which are outside the demise premises or, of course, those uh, acts which fall outside the more minor works and encompassed by clause uh, 2.6. Uh, so if we move on uh, to look at the uh, next clause, the landlord's covenant. And this is something that you see quite regularly now in res long residential tenancy agreements where there are lots of properties, or even just two. Uh, I've sometimes seen it where there's two uh, tenancies out of a single house. Um, first of all, every lease to be in similar terms, not the same, but similar. And then this one, at request of a tenant and subject to payment by the tenant, 
across an identity basis to enforce any covenants entered into with a landlord by a tenant of any residential unit in the building of a similar nature to those contained in clause two. So if, for example, one tenant is committing noise nuisance and breach of regulations, the idea is uh, you can indemnify the landlord uh, so that the landlord can go after that uh, recalcitrant tenant uh, if you don't have a direct right of action yourself. So if we go on to the next slide, a classic situation, uh, Mrs. Winfield, who owned one of the apartments, wanted a license to carry out works, but went outside clause 2.6 that her works were cut into the structural walls. Uh, Dr. Duval asked for landlord to secure an undertaking of Mrs. Winfield, knocked at in contravention of clause 2.7. So you can see uh, immediately trying to cut across the landlord's uh, normal right uh, to grant a license, even if they're not obliged to grant a license, under clause uh, 2.7. So if we move on to the next slide. So the first instance, uh, landlord has held her no power to waive any of the covenants in clause 2 without the consent of all of the other uh, lessees. So essentially clause 3.19 says you have to uh, everyone has to enter into covenants, landlord has to force them or can be empowered to enforce them if another tenant pays for the enforcement. Now, it might well be said at least with impractical results, particularly if it's a, a, a very large multi-occupancy building. And that was essentially the result taken on the uh, first uh, level of appeals as on Judge Parfit. Landlord did have power to license works that otherwise amount to a breach. And if we move on, well, the Court of Appeal uh, took a, a different stance altogether, held that effectively the uh, landlord uh, couldn't, uh, what would otherwise be, uh, couldn't waive a breach of covenant of clause 2.7, because that would place it in breach of 3.19. And if we move on to the next slide, uh, that result was upheld uh, by uh, the Supreme Court. If we move on uh, just a moment, yes. Um, we have uh, the interaction between 2.6 and 2.7. Uh, 2.6, routine improvements. 2.7, uh, much larger ones, going beyond routine alterations and improvements. I've been reading Woolworth & Co. Uh, Lambert case quite a lot in the last few weeks. It's probably the third time I've had to look at it. And it's quite interesting the way it deals with the interaction between these two kinds of covenants. So excluding from the operation of the absolute covenant, anything which falls within the qualified co covenant. If we move on to the next slide. So interestingly, the Supreme Court comes back to the question of a covenant for quiet enjoyment. The idea that a landlord cannot give with one hand and take away with another. So you can't, for example, allow a lessee to uh, interfere with support uh, for Dr. Duval's uh, flats. And uh, they were just going to speak a little bit more about noise nuisance. And Suffolk and Mills was, of course, a case about noise nuisance. It was a case about a landlord authorising a lessee to commit that nuisance. Of course, we know after Coventry and Lawrence, uh, normally the landlord uh, would not be liable for a tenant's nuisance unless, of course, they've authorised that nuisance in some way. So if we move on uh, from there, as an implied term, party who undertakes a, a, an obligation may be under a further obligation not to, prevent, uh, not to uh, prevent the contingency from occurring or put it out of their power to discharge the obligation if contingency arises. So really it's related to the prevention principle. Um, our purpose is to provide protection to all the lessees uh, in the building. So the landlord shouldn't be putting it out of their power to enforce uh, clause 2.7. Now, the real concern for landlords because of that is um, uh, quite often, a 125 year lease, you're going to want to uh, allow tenants to carry out works uh, for outside uh, rather limited works of alterations or improvements uh, envisaged by clause 2.6. The idea you then have to get permission of all the other tenants certainly has raised some concern uh, amidst um, uh, the question or, of management of a block uh, overall. Um, now, if we move on, I think um, 
now I'll hand over to Neil, I should say, one particular aspect of that is, uh, is noise nuisance. Thank you, David. Yes, one of the key issues from Deval for our purposes is whether we will now see more claims involving noise nuisance and conceivably other types of nuisance being brought as claims against landlords for breach of covenant. Clearly, uh, a flat owner that's suffering from noise nuisance can proceed in nuisance against its neighbour, but often that might not, might not be desirable, might be tricky, might be difficult, might be costlier and harder than proceeding against a landlord if you're able to do so. Um, typically, as David has pointed out, it's the offending occupier of the property who is liable in nuisance, not the landlord who has demised the land under a lease. So how does Deval help here? Well, let's consider the not unusual situation where a lease provides, for example, for flooring to be carpet only and an absolute prohibition on changing the flooring to hard floor. That could be a direct covenant or it could be a covenant or regulation within a schedule to the lease. If then the landlord is asked to grant consent to a tenant to replace that carpet with hard floor, despite there being an absolute prohibition and the landlord consents, uh, clearly un following Deval, if there is then impact noise disturbing the enjoyment of uh, lessees of a neighbouring flat or the flat below, uh, by granting consent, the landlord would already be in breach of a similar, similar mutual enforceability covenant such as clause 3.19 in Deval. So, simply by granting consent when there's an absolute prohibition preventing a landlord from granting consent, it could mean then that uh, there's automatically a claim that uh, could be brought against the landlord for having breached that covenant, granted consent when it shouldn't have done, uh, and therefore um, that's having caused damage to uh, the, the flat owner below who's suffering noise nuisance. And it's obviously where there is a claim such as that for breach of covenant, it might not just be damages, it could also be um, that a neighbouring landowner that, or a neighbouring lessee who's suffering from this noise nuisance could bring a different type of claim and um, seeking for any license that's been given to be rescinded or seeking an injunction to have works that have been carried out to flooring um, to be reinstated and to be reversed. Uh, as uh, David has also mentioned it's long been considered that the landlord won't be breaching a quiet enjoyment covenant simply by doing nothing where, where, a, where a noisy neighbour has been disturbing the enjoyment of other lessees unless a landlord has participated in that breach of nuisance, uh, sorry, breach of covenant or participated in the nuisance or authorised it, then a landlord isn't going to be liable. <clears throat> and that principle, uh, I think, could be challenged here. It's, uh, it's emphasised in the case of Fuladi, which coincidentally uh, was a decision of Zion Judge Parfit, who was also involved as the um, appellate judge or one of the appellate judges in Deval. Uh, in Fuladi, which is a decision of the High Court, um, a leaseholder successfully claimed against occupiers of the flat above for nuisance after disturbance from parties and um, impact noise. Now, the case was a little bit unusual because the tenants of the block in Fuladi, uh, which is a block in London, could actually enforce covenants against each other. So they had a direct, uh, the uh, tenant suffering from nuisance had a direct cause of action for breach of covenant against its neighbour, which is relatively unusual. You often have that in letting schemes, but it, it isn't um, particularly common. Having won below um, and succeeded in establishing nuisance uh, and breach of covenant against its um, neighbours, um, Fuladi um, then tried to cross appeal and, um, and claimed that the freeholder was liable because it had participated or actively participated in the nuisance. And Mr Justice Morgan dismissed that argument. Uh, he essentially held that simply standing by um, doesn't mean that the landlord is authorising or participating in a nuisance. The reason why Deval may be important here is that it can provide a gateway for claims by leaseholders against landlords where a landlord has granted consent, for example, to uh, alter, alter property or, or uh, replace flooring, which then creates a noise nuisance. And that is because um, if the grant of consent is itself a breach and that's caused disturbance, it doesn't seem then necessary for, a, for the lessee who is suffering to then go through and have to claim directly against a against its neighbour. Um, there's also no reason in principle why a leaseholder couldn't succeed where there's a qualified covenant. So uh, in Duval there was a qualified covenant, there's also an absolute prohibition um, and it was conceded in the Court of Appeal by um, Dr Duval's counsel that if there's a qualified covenant this issue doesn't arise. Qualified covenant means that a landlord can choose to grant consent. Um, it, it's difficult, I don't, I don't see why a landlord granting consent to alterations, let's go back to the example of floor coverings, where that 
would create an impact noise situation or create noise nuisance, how, how could it be said that that is a reasonable grant of consent, particularly if a landlord has obligations to its other lessees to, to ensure that they can have quiet enjoyment? Uh, so it seems um, that it is possible to argue, and it's more likely to succeed in this type of argument, that a lessee can claim against its landlord where a landlord has given consent where it shouldn't have done, and that's created a noise nuisance. If a landlord, for example, hasn't had an acoustic survey carried out or hasn't asked the tenant that's seeking consent to, to go through various steps to ensure that um, it will minimise any nuisance or it won't create a nuisance, it seems to me that the granting of consent could be challenged. The other options are, are less attractive. It's possible for nighttime noise to complain to the local authority relying on the Noise Act 1996, or it's possible to bring a private nuisance claim as what has happened in fact in, in Fuladi. But uh, as I mentioned in Fuladi, the claimant failed in, in its appeal, trying to pin liability on the freeholder. But moving then on from noise to encroachment, what do we mean by encroachment? Well, encroachment is a situation where a tenant occupies land that doesn't belong to it under its lease. It belongs to the landlord or it could belong to somebody else. If you imagine we have found that there have been a number of cases or number of um, disputes that have arisen in the last year or so involving encroachment. Uh, let's say you have a loft above a top floor flat or you have a roof terrace in a block of flats. Possibly it's a patio with storage boxes or a garage or even a driveway. If a tenant isn't entitled under its lease to occupy or to use those areas um, because they're not demised, it's possible they can lay claim to them under this principle of encroachment. Um, and by encroachment, it's possible that that land that's being occupied by that tenant can be incorporated into that tenant's lease. It's a little bit like adverse possession, but not quite the same, but it's clear, and we'll deal a little bit later with how this can have potentially serious effects on neighbours who may well enjoy rights over the land that's being encroached upon. But the basis of this principle is admittedly unclear. Uh, it's either based on estoppel or limitation or uh, a combination or something in the middle of those two, but none of the, neither of those possibilities, estoppel or limitation, is particularly satisfactory. One case which suggests that this doctrine of encroachment is based on estoppel or something like estoppel is a case of Perrot. In Perrot, a tenant was demised offices which had occupied under a lease, it also occupied land comprising lavatories next to those offices and it did that for five years. The landlord moaned a little bit about it but didn't do anything. At the end of the lease of the offices, the landlord claimed for disrepair that, had, that existed in the, in the building contained the lavatories and it was held that the tenant couldn't deny that the lavatories were part of its lease. So let's remember that the lavatories aren't demised on the lease, the, la the tenant has been occupying them and claiming that it's entitled to or that it can occupy them. And Lord Justice Denning said that the principle underlying the cases on encroachment is not perhaps strictly on estoppel, but is akin to it. If a tenant takes possession of adjoining property and by his conduct represents that he's holding it under the demise, then if the landlord acts on that representation by allowing the tenant to remain in possession, the tenant afterwards cannot assert that he is holding it on any other footing. But in that case, it appears to have been a positive representation by the tenant that I'm going to occupy this land, stop me, essentially. Uh, what if there is no such representation? Can you really found encroachment on the stopple where there's been no representation? Uh, a tenant has simply surreptitiously possibly occupied the loft. You know, the loft is accessible in a block of flats. Uh, it's not demised to anybody. Uh, you can only really get to it through a hatch in the top floor flat. What if that's happened for many years without the landlord even knowing about it? Um, can it be that, that's, that there is an estoppel at play? Uh, I think it's, it's arguable that that's, that's not the correct um, analysis of that situation. Uh, the, the other case that, that I noted there is um, Secretary of Just for Justice and Chao Ka Chik So, which is a decision of the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong. In that case, the tenants of a fish farm had extended their farm onto other land belonging to the Hong Kong government and had done so for more than 60 years. Uh, 60 years in Hong Kong is a relevant limitation period for bringing claims uh, in respect of possession of land. And it was held in that case by the Court of Final Appeal that that long period of possession of land that belonged to its landlord but wasn't part of its lease extinguished the landlord's title. Now, I'm not clear that that's a correct as a, as a matter of English law, because how can a landlord's freehold title be extinguished by adverse possession, essentially, of its tenant? Uh, but Lord Scott was the non-permanent judge in that case, and it's possible that his reasoning could be followed 
in cases in, in the High Court in England. Um, the difficulty with limitation, as I mentioned, is that it, it's difficult to see how a tenant can, um, it's long held being the principle that a tenant can't adversely possess land against its landlord. What is a sufficient period in the extent of possession? These, these are unanswered questions. Uh, it seems unclear. If, it, if the doctrine is based on limitation um, and adverse possession, possibly you need 10 years occupation, as you do under the Land Registration Act 2002, and then a period of two years following which you can apply to be registered as, as, lease, uh, as owner um, of that land that you've adversely possessed. Um, or it could be that 12 years possession debars a landlord from saying, hey, that's my land, I've got freehold title, can't do that after 12 years in principle um, and the answer isn't clear. It, it might also be possible that um, it, one can apply to the land registry to alter title. So if a tenant has been occupying a, a, a loft or, or a garage, for example, not part of its lease, but has been doing that for long enough, it's possible then if that, assuming that land is adjacent to its own property, to uh, ask the land registry to alter title to reflect um, its adverse possession or at least its encroachment onto that other land. Um, you can easily see how problems can arise between neighbours here because it may well be the loft is at the very top of a, an enfranchised building uh, and all the, the tenants and who are neighbours uh, may well want to share in the development value of that loft rather than allowing the top floor flat to, to simply encroach into it and adopt uh, and annex it to its own tenancy. Um, it's also a problem if easements exist over that land, whether it's a, it might be a patio it might be a driveway or, or it might be a storage box, might be under stairs cupboard, whatever it is, if tenants and your neighbours uh, or, or the landowners, the lessee's neighbours have rights over that land, but what happens when that land is incorporated into a tenant's tenancy? It seems to me that uh, if the doctrine is based on a stopple or any sort of equitable doctrine, that um, the tenant encroaching on that land has to take it subject to whatever rights um, pre-exist. I'll now pass over to David to deal with a slightly different situation where there's encroachment by a lessee onto somebody else's land. Now, as we move into extra time and penalties, um, let's have a quick look at adverse possession by a tenant onto a third party's land. And the law here has a very confused and slightly problematic rationale. It's quite clear that it inures to the landlord's benefits if a tenant uh, encroaches onto land belonging to someone else and they are, are able to acquire by adverse possession it's seen as if it inures for the landlord's benefit if it's close to a demised land occupy a tenant together with demised land and there's no different intention by the landlord or a tenant within that period of adverse possession so if we move on uh, to the next slide uh, this was considered in Tower Hamlets and Barrett case and the case of the palm tree public house. And it's quite usual facts. And we, we often see this with tenant cases. Uh, next to the pub was a storage area, which the tenants used. And if we move on uh, again to the next slide, uh, what had happened uh, was they held on to it. Uh, in fact, it had become part of a freehold title uh, of the uh, of the landlord. And when they tried to, and when they purchased the freehold from the landlord. And the di dispute was, well, actually, who owns this plot of land? Is it the original freeholder? Is it the uh, freeholder of the pub who sold it to the tenant? Or is it the former tenant who now owns all of it? And it was held, is the tenant owns all of it. So the standard provision uh, in Kingsmill Millard uh, was, uh, was, was set out. So if we move on to the next slide. And Lord Justice Newberg, as he then was, said, well, it's a rebuttable presumption of an unclear uh, rationale. We made it clear it must be very close to the uh, demised land. And if we move on to the next slide. So we could see it's almost a question of, um, of, of, of uh, natural justice here. It's a question then, if you then transfer uh, a tenancy and you purchase a freehold of the tenancy, so there's a presumption that the new on the sale, that the or new tenancy, then it extends to the adjoining land, which has been acquired by the freeholder of the tenancy. Now, the precise ambit of this rule is really quite unclear. 
But what happens if in the relevant conveyance is absolutely pinpoint crystal clear what is being sold? Um, the presumption, how, what does it take to overcome that presumption? So it's a very interesting case. You can see how it could regularly happen. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. And again, what we see a very similar rule uh, where, which I often rely upon uh, when it comes to tenant properties. If you have tenants who use uh, another land, a uh, Serbian tenement in due course, and they acquire a right of way, that becomes part of the, uh, that inures to a freehold version. And that came up in the rights of light case in Metropolitan Housing Trust Limited against RMC. And really, um, it was held effectively in years to the freeholder, but then it's demised back down to the uh, tenant. But again, uh, these decisions are difficult to reconcile, and not least because it isn't entirely clear what the underlying rationale is. So if we move on, uh, Niraj, I think that's what we have time for today. Uh, we obviously answered a lot of question about tree roots. Um, there's a huge amount of um, disputes and all of these points, and everyone's now discussing the webinar, we've all dealt with cases uh, arising out of all of these points. So if you have any questions arising out of today's webinar, then please don't hesitate to contact us uh, in chambers or on our email or, or via our, our practice management team. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.